Israel open to civilian return to North Gaza in truce talks. Israel has shown openness to the return of displaced Palestinians from the northern Gaza Strip as part of ongoing truce negotiations with Hamas. These talks, mediated by Qatar and Egypt, aim to suspend Israel's offensive in exchange for the release of hostages held by Hamas. While Hamas seeks an end to the fighting and withdrawal of Israeli forces, Israel refuses these terms, aiming to dismantle Hamas's governance and military capabilities eventually. Initially opposed to allowing displaced Palestinians to return, Israel's stance has softened, with discussions now open on the matter. Israel has also agreed in principle to release between 700 and 800 Palestinian prisoners in exchange for 40 hostages, potentially meeting Hamas's demand. However, the final decision depends on the status of the prisoners, particularly if they are senior militants serving long sentences for lethal attacks. Israeli cabinet members say they oppose ultra-orthodox conscription plan in threat to coalition government. Two members of Israel's war cabinet expressed opposition to government proposals regarding the conscription of ultra-orthodox men into the military, potentially jeopardizing the government coalition. The Israeli Supreme Court had set a deadline for the government to address the issue of ultra-orthodox conscription and funding for their religious schools, which are exempt from military service. Defense Minister Yov Gallant stated his refusal to support the emerging proposal, emphasizing the need for broad political consensus. Benny Gantz, another member of the War Cabinet, indicated that he would leave the government if the plans were implemented. Considering it a red line. The government is considering delaying the Supreme Court's deadline and maintaining the status quo exemption while working on permanent legislation. Proposed reforms include raising the age of exemption and creating special military units for the ultra-Orthodox. The issue of ultra-Orthodox conscription has been a long-standing debate in Israel, with public opinion largely in favor of reform. Gallant called for cooperation to reach a consensus on conscription laws for the benefit of the IDF and Israel. Israeli forces surround two more Gaza hospitals, Palestinian Red Crescent says. Israeli forces have surrounded two hospitals in the Gaza Strip, according to the Palestinian Red Crescent Society, PRCS, amid ongoing fighting despite international efforts for a ceasefire. Alamal Hospital and Nasser Hospital in southern Gaza are both encircled, posing danger to medical teams. Israeli forces are also operating at Al-Shifa Hospital, Gaza's largest, claiming to have apprehended terrorists and seized weapons there. The death toll in Gaza since the conflict began stands at over 32,000, with many more injured. Despite previous claims of completing operations in northern Gaza, the IDF has returned to the area. Citing increased Hamas presence. The IDF launched a fresh operation at Al-Shifa, alleging Hamas use of the facility. Hospitals have become battlegrounds, with Israel accusing them of harboring militants, a claim denied by doctors and Hamas. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called for a ceasefire and humanitarian access to Gaza, sparking criticism from Israel. Relations between Israel and the UN remain strained, with mutual accusations of bias and involvement in the conflict. Israel not allowing UNRWA aid into northern Gaza, agency chief says. Israel has stopped UNRWA, the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees, from sending aid convoys into northern Gaza, where civilians are facing famine, according to UNRWA Chief Philippe Lazzarini. Despite the worsening humanitarian situation, Israel informed the UN that it won't approve any food convoys to the north. This move has been criticized as obstructing life-saving assistance during a man-made famine. The Israeli military has launched a new operation in Khan Yunus in the south of the Gaza Strip, with reports of heavy shelling and troops surrounding hospitals. The Gaza Health Ministry reports a high death toll and injuries from Israeli military operations since the beginning of the conflict in October. Israel accuses Hamas of misusing medical facilities for military purposes, a claim denied by Hamas. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres in new ceasefire call. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has urged for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and called on Israel to allow unrestricted access for humanitarian aid. Guterres highlighted the dire humanitarian situation, with 1.1 million people in Gaza facing catastrophic hunger. He condemned the blocking of a US draft resolution for a ceasefire tied to the release of hostages by Russia and China. Guterres visited the Rafah crossing to spotlight the plight of Palestinians in Gaza and emphasized the need for Israel to facilitate aid delivery.
Israel's foreign minister criticized Guterres for blaming Israel for the humanitarian crisis without condemning Hamas. The war in Gaza, triggered by Hamas attacks in October, has resulted in significant casualties and ongoing conflict. Guterres's visit coincides with Israel's plans for a ground operation in Rafah, where a large population is seeking shelter amidst continued violence. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu affirmed Israel's determination to achieve its war aims despite international pressure. Hamas blasts terror attack in Moscow, praises Russia for rejecting UN Security Council vote. Hamas, a designated terrorist organization, has condemned the recent terror attack in Moscow that claimed many lives. The group expressed condolences to Russia and its people, condemning the attack in the strongest terms. Hamas had earlier praised Russia, China, and Algeria for rejecting a US-led UN Security Council resolution calling for a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas. The resolution was criticized for allegedly enabling Israel to continue its aggression in Gaza. Hamas accused the US of providing unwavering support to Israel, leading to significant casualties in Gaza. According to the Gaza Health Ministry, thousands have been killed and injured since the conflict began in October. Harris suggests consequences are on the table for Israel if Netanyahu invades Rafah. Vice President Kamala Harris has warned of potential consequences for Israel if it proceeds with an invasion of Rafah in Gaza. In an interview with ABC News, Harris described such a move by Netanyahu's government as a huge mistake, emphasizing that there would be nowhere for civilians to go. When pressed about potential consequences from the United States, Harris stated, I am ruling out nothing. This statement follows Netanyahu's vow to proceed with an invasion, with or without U.S. support. Israel contends that Rafah is a stronghold of Hamas that must be defeated to meet its war objectives, but the Biden administration insists on robust protections for civilians. Despite Israel's assurances of addressing humanitarian needs, an invasion of Rafah is deemed imminent. Bolton hits Biden for Gaza resolution rejected by UN, very detrimental to Israel. Former National Security Advisor John Bolton criticized President Biden after the United Nations Security Council rejected a US-backed resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza and the release of all hostages held by Hamas. Bolton described the resolution as detrimental to Israel's efforts to combat Hamas terrorists. The resolution, backed by the Biden administration, marked a significant shift in US policy, previously blocking similar attempts for a ceasefire. Bolton argued that the change in stance was not linked to any agreement to exchange hostages, suggesting it aligned with European and Hamas interests. He criticized China and Russia for vetoing the resolution, interpreting it as a sign of their view of Biden as weak and ineffective. The rejection of previous resolutions without conditions indicates a shift in Biden administration's approach to the conflict, as pressure mounts to temper Israel's wartime conduct amidst humanitarian concerns. Since the conflict began in October, Casualties have risen significantly, with Gaza facing the risk of famine in its northern region. Following Schumer and Biden comments on Jewish state, locals have a message, stay out of Israeli politics. Israelis in Jerusalem's Meshane Yehuda food market expressed discontent with U.S. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's criticism of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's handling of the Gaza conflict and his suggestion for new elections in Israel. They argued that it's not Schumer's place to comment on Israeli politics and that Israel knows how to handle its affairs. Some suggested that Schumer should focus on his own re-election rather than interfering in Israeli politics. There were also sentiments that President Biden's recent actions, including demanding a delegation from Israel to discuss strategy in Gaza, were driven by political interests ahead of the U.S. elections. Some Israelis expressed distrust in Biden and praised former President Trump for his support of Israel. Regarding potential elections in Israel, opinions were mixed, with some still supporting Netanyahu despite criticism, while others called for change due to his long tenure as prime minister and recent controversies. Netanyahu's history of electoral challenges and the context of ongoing protests against his government's policies were also highlighted. Ocasio-Cortez defends accusing Israel of genocide, I believe we have crossed the threshold of intent. Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez defended her characterization of Israel's actions in Gaza as genocide, citing what she perceives as a deliberate humanitarian crisis. She highlighted the dire situation in Gaza, including the risk of famine for 1.1 million people and the slow delivery of aid, which she attributes to intentional actions by the Israeli government.
Ocasio-Cortez emphasized the distinction between criticizing the Israeli government's policies and targeting Israeli citizens. She rejected the notion that Hamas's actions should dictate aid access, emphasizing that the suffering of civilians, especially children, should not be tied to political considerations. Ocasio-Cortez's remarks reflect a growing concern among progressives and Democrats about civilian casualties and humanitarian conditions in Gaza amidst ongoing violence. She called for the Biden administration to halt military aid to Israel and increase support for Gaza civilians. A method being weighed for distributing U.S. aid in Gaza could put U.S. troops at risk, officials say. The Biden administration plans to deliver humanitarian aid to Gaza via a floating dock, but no U.S. personnel will be involved in distributing the aid on the ground due to security concerns. Instead, the aid will be transferred from civilian ships to U.S. Army boats, and then handed off to drivers and guards from other nations or private security guards. These individuals will transport the aid to distribution points in Gaza, potentially exposing the operation to security risks such as the insertion of explosives onto aid trucks. Another option under consideration is to have the Israel Defense Forces, IDF, provide security for the aid distribution process. But this could result in delays and logistical challenges. U.S. military officials are still working through the plans, including how to screen trucks for explosives before they are driven onto the pier. Despite the risks, personnel involved in the operation are committed to the mission of delivering aid to Gaza's population. Houthi strike Chinese ship in Red Sea despite safe passage assurances. The Iran-backed Houthi militia attacked a Chinese-owned oil tanker, M-V Huangpu, with anti-ship ballistic missiles in the Red Sea, despite prior assurances of safe passage for Chinese vessels. The attack occurred amidst the Houthis' blockade of the Red Sea, which they initiated to support Hamas during the conflict with Israel. Despite international efforts to deter the blockade, including a coalition formed by the U.S. and other nations, the Houthis continue their attacks on global shipping, targeting vessels from various countries. The attack on the Chinese ship underscores the escalating risk to maritime security in the region. For men charged in Moscow attack, showing signs of beatings at hearing as court says to accept guilt. For men accused of staging a terrorist attack on a concert hall in Russia, which resulted in the deaths of over 130 people, appeared before a Moscow court. Signs of severe beatings raised questions about the circumstances of their confessions. The suspects, identified as citizens of Tajikistan, faced charges of committing a terrorist attack. Russian media reported allegations of torture during their interrogation. The court ordered them to be held in custody pending investigation and trial. The attack, claimed by an affiliate of the Islamic State Group, prompted a national day of mourning in Russia. President Putin linked the attack to Ukraine, but Kiev denied involvement. Rescuers continued to search for victims, and families awaited news of missing loved ones. The IS affiliate claimed responsibility for the attack, which involved gunfire and explosives. The incident raised concerns about security and the efficacy of counterterrorism measures in Russia. Russia casts doubt on Islamic State responsibility for concert attack. Russia is casting doubt on the United States' assertion that the Islamic State militant group was responsible for the gun attack on a concert hall outside Moscow, which killed 137 people and injured 182. President Putin has not publicly mentioned the Islamist militant group in connection with the attackers, instead alleging they were trying to escape to Ukraine. Russia's foreign ministry spokeswoman questioned the U.S. assertion, suggesting it was spreading a version of the bogeyman of Islamic State to divert blame. Unverified videos of the suspects' interrogations circulated on social media, showing signs of severe beatings. The attack occurred amid heightened tensions between Russia and Ukraine, with Putin ordering a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. House leaves for a two-week break, without addressing Ukraine aid. The House left for its two-week Easter recess without passing critical military aid for Ukraine, despite the nation's urgent need for ammunition amid the Russian invasion. Speaker Mike Johnson delayed addressing funding for Ukraine until mid-April, stating the need to focus on funding the U.S. government first. President Zelensky has emphasized the importance of U.S. aid for Ukraine's survival. Former President Trump and GOP allies have opposed the Senate-passed aid package, complicating efforts to provide assistance. Johnson is considering various options for a supplemental aid package for Ukraine, including treating non-military aid as a loan and seizing assets of Russian oligarchs.
Some House Democrats criticized the delay in aiding Ukraine, while top Republicans urged Johnson to pass the Senate bill quickly. Democrats are considering a discharge petition to force a vote on the Senate-passed bill, while bipartisan efforts are underway to draft alternative legislation incorporating border security provisions. Russian missile enters Polish airspace as Moscow lashes out at Ukraine after ISIS attack. In the aftermath of a deadly terrorist attack at a concert hall in Moscow, Russian forces launched a series of airstrikes against Ukrainian targets. Amidst this escalation, a Russian missile breached Polish airspace, prompting Poland to demand explanations from Russia. The attack in Moscow resulted in at least 133 deaths, with 11 suspects detained, four of whom were directly involved. Russian President Vladimir Putin alleged that the perpetrators attempted to flee to Ukraine, where a window was prepared for them. Despite Ukraine denying involvement, Russian authorities identified the gunmen as migrants from Tajikistan. Although ISIS claimed responsibility for the attack, Putin did not mention the group in his speech regarding the tragedy. Philippines summons China envoy over standoff, dares Beijing to seek arbitration. The Philippines lodged a diplomatic protest against China's aggressive actions in the South China Sea, particularly at the Second Thomas Shoal, where China's Coast Guard allegedly used water cannon against a Filipino civilian boat supplying troops. The incident is the latest in a series of tensions between the two countries over territorial claims in the region. Despite a 2016 ruling by the Permanent Court of Arbitration rejecting China's claims, China continues to assert its sovereignty over almost the entire South China Sea, including areas within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, EEZ. Philippine officials, including Defense Secretary Gilberto Teodoro, have challenged China to pursue international arbitration to clarify its claims rather than resorting to intimidation tactics. These tensions coincide with Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr.'s efforts to deepen ties with the United States, including expanding military cooperation, a move viewed with suspicion by China. North Korea says Japan's Kishida showed intention to meet Kim Jong-un recently. Kim Yo-jong, the influential sister of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, revealed that Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida expressed his desire to meet with her brother through another channel, as reported by state media KCNA. However, Kim emphasized that the improvement of bilateral relations hinges on Japan's ability to make practical political decisions. She warned that Japan's actions, particularly those perceived as antagonistic or violative of North Korea's sovereign rights, could label it as an enemy and subject it to retaliation. Prime Minister Kishida reaffirmed the importance of a summit meeting to address issues like the abduction of Japanese citizens by North Korean agents decades ago. Meanwhile, Japan's government spokesperson Yoshimasa Hayashi rejected North Korea's claim that the abduction issue has been resolved, highlighting a potential obstacle to improving ties. Kishida has expressed his willingness to engage in talks with Kim Jong-un without preconditions, aiming to realize the first summit between their country's leaders in 20 years. South Korea is reportedly coordinating closely with Japan on matters related to North Korea, including potential contacts between Tokyo and Pyongyang. Kim Yo-jong suggested that Japan could open a new path for better relations by demonstrating mutual respect and respectful behavior, hinting at the possibility of a future visit by Kishida to Pyongyang.